You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Hey, sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, except no imitation. I've got to start with Vikings Lions. A really good game. A very easy game to get into. You've got the Lions storming out to a 20 to 6 lead. At the half, you're thinking, okay, this is it. They're going to get their first win. It's going to be an easy W. Then the Vikings come storming back. They make a game of it. Kirk Cousins had a really good game. Jared Goff had a really good game. Justin Jefferson was great. Alex Madison was solid. Jamal Williams was solid. Just a very exciting game. Now, let me set the stage for you. Five and a half minutes left. The Lions have the ball at the 19-yard line. All they have to do is run out the clock, just sit on the football, And they'll win their first game. They're up 23-21 to at this point. Instead, Dan Campbell decides to be incredibly aggressive. The first two plays in that drive were passes. One of them was incomplete. The other one made it third and one. Jamal Williams got stuffed, so it's now 4th and 1 at the Lions 28. So what would you do? 4th and 1 at your own 28. You're up by 2. You're punting the football, right? No, the Lions went for it. And it was absolutely disastrous. Jared Goff fumbled. The Vikings recovered. They then sat on the football. Scored a touchdown. They missed the two-point conversion. But with a buck 50 left on the clock, the Vikings were up by four. I could hear... Tens of thousands of people criticizing Dan Campbell for going for it on 4th and 1 at his own 28. I don't care what the analytics say. That has to be, without question, one of the worst coaching decisions made this year. To go for it on 4th and 1 at your own 28. Not the Vikings 28. If it's the Vikings 28, okay. That makes perfect sense. Your own 28-yard line. I don't even think I would do that in Madden. Look, I understand wanting to be aggressive. I understand the possibility... Of taking more time off the clock. But for goodness sake. It's not like Kirk Cousins was struggling. Against you. 
He completed 75% of his passes for 340 yards and two touchdowns. You couldn't stop him to save your life. I mean, all you did was gift the Vikings six points and put your team behind the eight ball. Buck 50 on the clock. Ball at the Lions 25. Does Jared Goff have some magic in him? Yes. Yes, he does. Somehow, some way, Goff was able to drive down the field and with four seconds left, find a Monra St. Brown for the game-winning touchdown. St. Brown was really good. Ten catches for 86 yards and a touchdown. So the Lions won 29-27. to Sometimes teams are able to compensate for their coaches' bad decisions. And you know what? There are football gods. There are sports gods. The Lions already have one winless season to their name. No one wanted them to have a second. So Goff worked some magic and found a way to lead his team to victory. You've got to feel really good for the Lions. No one wants any team to have a winless season. All right, my team started out the year 0-13 last year. I know how painful it is. I know how nerve-wracking it is to think that For time immemorial, you'll be mentioned as one of the worst teams in NFL history. The tie wasn't enough. The Lions needed a win. This was really their only winnable game left. Maybe in Atlanta? But that's tough. Falcons aren't a bad team this year. I'm really happy for the Lions. I think everyone outside of the state of Minnesota is happy for the Lions. I mean, if you're a Vikings fan, you've got to be furious. You allow a game-winning two-minute drill against the Lions? And you're trying to sneak into the playoffs as the second or third wildcard team? That's not going to work. Mike Zimmer has been on the hot seat for a while. This won't help things. I mean, I like Mike Zimmer. I think overall he's done a good job with the Vikings, but sometimes coaches just wear out their welcome. The message gets stale. For whatever reason, it just doesn't work. I think that's what's happening with Zimmer. It'll be interesting if another team gives him a shot. He's 65. The trend now is to hire younger coaches. So would you hire someone who's going to be 66 on week one. Someone who's proven that he's a solid coach in the NFL. Or would you go younger? Would you go with an unproven assistant? It'll be interesting to see how the coaching carousel turns. At the very least, I expect Zimmer to get some interviews. I do think this is his last year with the Vikings, though. Moving on now to another controversial decision. That happened in Raven Steelers. It was looking solid for the Ravens. 
through the first three quarters. They were able to stop the Steelers' offense. After three, they were leading 10-3. I mean, you'd like Lamar Jackson to do a little bit more, but... Hey, if the Ravens' defense is going to shut down Ben Roethlisberger, you don't need an epic Jackson performance, right? Well, in the fourth quarter, Roethlisberger came alive. Let a four-play drive that should have resulted in the game being tied, but Chris Boswell missed the extra point. Then Justin Tucker hit a field goal. Then Boswell hit a field goal. So it's 13 to 12 Ravens at this point. The Ravens go three and out. Roethlisberger gets the ball at his own 31. Just under six and a half minutes left. He leads the Steelers on a big 11-play drive. It results in a touchdown. He makes the two-point conversion. 20-13 to Steelers. But you can't count Lamar Jackson out. He leads the Ravens on a big two-minute drill, including an epic 3rd and 14 conversion. Great pass to Marquise Brown. With 12 seconds left, Jackson completed a touchdown pass to Sammy Watkins. So it's 20 to 19 Steelers at this point. John Harbaugh decided to be aggressive. Instead of kicking the extra point, and you know Justin Tucker would have made it because he's probably the greatest kicker in NFL history. Harbaugh decided to go for two. He decided to trust his quarterback. Now that decision actually worked. Jackson threw a solid pass to Mark Andrews. I mean, it was a pass that you gotta think would have resulted in a conversion. Instead, Andrews just dropped it. It hit off his left fingertips. He couldn't corral it. The pass fell incomplete. Would it have definitely resulted in a two-point conversion? Definitely is pushing it, but... I think the odds are that Andrews would have powered into the end zone. See, now that's a decision that I don't mind. I don't mind being aggressive there. What would you rather do? Play for the tie or play for the win? You're going up against a division rival. And not for nothing, but the Ravens defense really did a bad job Stopping Roethlisberger in the fourth quarter. So if he kept that up, you're immediately behind the eight ball. I don't mind playing for the win there. It's one of those decisions that if it works, you look like a genius. If it doesn't, you look foolish. And again, the decision worked. Like, Greg Roman called a play that probably would have resulted in a conversion if Mark Andrews could have caught the football. He's the reason that the Ravens lost. Him and the Ravens' offensive line. Because Lamar Jackson got sacked seven times. Okay, that can't happen. But again, if Andrews catches that football... He probably goes in for two, and you win the game. Instead, he dropped it. He's the seminal reason that the Ravens lost. The decision was correct. The analytics there 
say go for it. Now again, you can't always rely on analytics. Analytics supported Dan Campbell's decision. I don't think anyone in their right mind would have gone for it there. But the decision to go for two, to go for the win, I don't think can be begrudged. The play worked. Mark Andrews just dropped the football. The Ravens should have won. And here's another thing. You remember I told you about the missed extra point by Boswell? If he had made that extra point, there's no issue. Of course you go for two. It's kind of interesting how one missed kick opens the door to questioning John Harbaugh. I had no problem with going for it. If given the choice between playing for the win or playing for overtime, I don't mind playing for the win. I honestly had no problem with what John Harbaugh did. My issue is with Mark Andrews because that's a football that he needs to catch. He should have powered into the end zone. It should have resulted in a Ravens win. Instead, the Steelers won. But that's not even the biggest story out of Pittsburgh. The biggest story is a report from Adam Schefter of ESPN that says that Ben Roethlisberger expects this to be his last year with the Steelers. It brings up the question, would Roethlisberger play for another team? That, according to Schefter, is highly unlikely. So it seems like this is it for Roethlisberger. And I think that's the correct decision. I think it's clear that Roethlisberger has kind of taken a step back. This year, he's only thrown 16 touchdown passes. You know how many he threw last year? 33. He's not going to get anywhere close to that. I mean, realize, he's 39. He's a two-time Super Bowl winner. He has nothing left to accomplish. I mean, it's kind of funny. You think about the 04 NFL draft. There's some controversy with Eli. Is he a Hall of Famer? I think yes. I know people who say no. Is Philip Rivers a Hall of Famer? I'm probably in the yes camp, but I know a lot of people who say no. And admittedly, if Rivers needs to wait a while, I'm not upset with that. Ben Roethlisberger is probably the easiest Hall of Famer out of the top three quarterbacks in that draft. One of the greatest quarterback drafts in NFL history. There was a fourth first round quarterback. You know who it was? J.P. Lozman. Taken 22nd overall by the Bills. How's that for a name out of the past? Lozman had like one good year. Then the NFL figured him out. Ben Roethlisberger has the postseason success that will result in Eli getting into the Hall of Fame, and he has the regular season success that will result in Rivers getting into the Hall of Fame. The only thing I'll say, this is my only knock on Roethlisberger, was there ever a point where you thought he was one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL? Like, was there ever a year where he was in your top five? Maybe he was borderline top five. 
But was there ever a year that you'd put him ahead of Brady? Ahead of Peyton Manning? Ahead of Rodgers? Ahead of Breeze? Ahead of a guy like Philip Rivers? Ahead of Matt Ryan? What about younger players? Guys like Russell Wilson? That's the knock on Roethlisberger. He is a Wall of Famer. I just don't know if he was ever one of the top five quarterbacks of his era. At the end of the day, six Pro Bowls in 18 years is not great. That's one Pro Bowl every three years. Does that get you in the Hall of Fame? Probably not. No MVPs. And also, in Super Bowl Forty, he was dreadful. Okay, yes, he won it. But the guy completed less than 50% of his passes for only 123 yards. Antoine Randall had a better game throwing the football than Roethlisberger did. I mean, I guess you gotta give Roethlisberger credit for enabling Heinz Ward to get Super Bowl MVP. Ward had five catches for 123 yards and a touchdown. I guess he doesn't get that without Roethlisberger. And at the end of the day, he was the guy who was responsible for the iconic Santonio Holmes catch. He's the one who threw that football against the Cardinals in Super Bowl 43. That's an iconic moment. But no one remembers Roethlisberger throwing that football. They remember Holmes making the catch. They remember James Harrison having the 100-yard pick six at the half. From an anecdotal standpoint, I don't think Roethlisberger's a Hall of Famer, but he does have two rings. As a quarterback, that means something. He doesn't have the two MVPs like Eli does, but you look at where he is on the career leaderboards, you can't leave him out. You can't leave a guy out who's sixth all-time in passing yards and eighth all-time in touchdowns. It's the Philip Rivers argument. Ben Roethlisberger is a Hall of Famer. He has a better argument than Eli, and he has a better argument than Rivers. But it's kind of funny that from an anecdotal standpoint, you can poke holes in that argument. Moving on now to the Panthers actually listening to me and firing Joe Brady. I guess they realized that they should have listened to me and not traded for Sam Darnold. They decided to listen to me now and fire Joe Brady. I think this is the right decision. I spoke about it last week. I'm not going to go too far into it again. I think Joe Brady was overrated for a long time. I thought it was disgusting that he was getting head coaching interviews. I thought there were a lot of people out there that deserved those opportunities more. I think every team that interviewed him and didn't offer him the job, dodged a bullet. I think it's clear that he just doesn't have what it takes to be successful in the NFL. Now he'll go back to college and he'll do really well. Like, I could see him going back to LSU. Brian Kelly's gotten some heat for not being a true Southerner, for trying too hard to endear himself to LSU fans. People had a field day with the fake Southern accent 
that he put on. You know what would shut those people up? If Kelly brought back Joe Brady. And it would be kind of funny. Brady would obviously take over as offensive coordinator. The current offensive coordinator for the Tigers is Jake Peets. You don't need to know who that is. I'll tell you who he is. He was the quarterback's coach last year for the Panthers. So how funny would it be if Joe Brady leaves the Panthers, goes back to LSU, and ends up taking over for the former quarterback's coach for the Panthers. I just think that would be very funny. But look, it's obviously a great decision to fire Brady. He was in over his head. It seems like Rule is too a little bit, but the Panthers are kind of stuck with him for a little bit. I think it's interesting that Jeff Nixon was promoted to interim offensive coordinator. He was the running backs coach. I wanted the tight ends coach, Brian Angelicchio, but I guess it doesn't matter a ton. I just don't think Nixon really deserves it since he comes from the Matt Rule coaching tree, and I don't think that tree works in the NFL. Angelicchio's an NFL veteran. He's been in the NFL nonstop since 2012. I would have liked him more than Nixon, but I guess it doesn't matter a ton. At least the Panthers fired Brady. Okay, that was the most important thing. I mean, I'll say this. It's not a guarantee that Brady goes back to LSU. He may go to Oklahoma as Brent Venables' offensive coordinator. That is right. Brent Venables will take over for Lincoln Riley. If you don't know who Venables is, that's okay. He's just one of the most highly respected assistant coaches in the nation. He's been defensive coordinator at Clemson since 2012. Won two national titles there. He won the Broyles Award in 2016, which goes to the best assistant coach in college football. It's kind of surprising that he hadn't gotten an opportunity before to be a head coach. But I think he'll work wonders at Oklahoma. He knows Oklahoma. Before he got to Clemson, he spent 12 years with the Sooners. So this is a homecoming that can work. I mean, Brent Venables has a sterling reputation. And I think he's going to do a really good job with the Sooners. It does surprise me that the Sooners didn't go with someone a little more proven. That they didn't go with a small school head coach. It's very interesting that schools like Notre Dame and Oklahoma went with former defensive coordinators. I mean, Notre Dame promotes their defensive coordinator that no one's ever heard of. Oklahoma hires a well-respected defensive coordinator. That's all well and good, but... You didn't even want to reach out to Luke Fickle. You didn't want to reach out to Jamie Chadwell. You didn't want to reach out to Hugh Freeze. No? We're just going to hire unproven coordinators? Okay. I mean, look, I think Venables will work out. Like I said... Great reputation. He deserved an opportunity a long time ago. And I don't know if this is going to happen, but think about it. The Sooners could have Brent Venables leading the defense and Joe Brady leading the offense. That could work. 
That would be incredible. Yes, I think Brady will go back to college and be successful. Just because he failed in the pros doesn't mean he won't make it in college. Nick Saban, Steve Spurrier, Lou Holtz, Bud Wilkinson. I don't like Brady in the NFL, but in college, he's excellent. In fact, I'll even go a step further. If Brady spends a substantial period of time in college and takes his time and improves as a coach, it wouldn't surprise me if he was back in the NFL. But that's way, 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 way down the line. Moving on now to Mario Cristobal coming home. He is leaving Oregon to return to the U as their head coach. If you don't know, Cristobal was born in Miami. He played at the U. He started his coaching career there as a graduate assistant. Then he went to Rutgers, but he went back to the U as their tight ends coach. Then he was their offensive line coach. Then he went to FIU, spent some time in Alabama, went to Oregon. Now he's back at the U. This is the perfect hire. I have a friend who's a big fan of the U. He is disgusted with where the program is. And I don't blame him. See, the thing is, when you're a school like Miami, and you have the history that Miami does, five national titles, some of the best players in college football history stepping onto that field, iconic moments, it's not enough to just make lesser bowl games. You have to contend for national titles. Manny Diaz never got the U anywhere close to that. Mark Richt did, but that year ended really poorly. That was 2017. The U went 10 and 0 to start. They were ranked 2nd in the nation. They then got upset by Pittsburgh, a bad Panthers team. Then they lost to Clemson in the ACC title game. They got destroyed 38 to 3. Then they lost the Orange Bowl to Wisconsin. That's not enough. You've got to contend for national titles. You've got to win a national title. It is perfectly okay to want the second coming of Howard Schnellenberger or Jimmy Johnson or Dennis Erickson or Larry Coker. Guys like Randy Shannon and Al Golden aren't going to get the job done. Maybe they weren't terrible coaches. I don't think anyone can look at a guy like Manny Diaz or Richt or Golden or Shannon and say they're bad coaches. It's just not enough. You've got to contend for national titles. Those guys didn't. I think that Mario Cristobal can contend for national titles with the U. Here's a guy who knows the area, who understands what it means to be the Hurricanes head coach, someone who took over Oregon and had them in the national title discussion. 
They were a CFP team earlier this year. In 2019, they were in the discussion until they lost to ASU. I think this can work. Mario Cristobal was the perfect hire for the U. Outstanding job by the school. They got this hire right. No, more than that. They did a perfect job. You know what's funny? I wanted to start my college football vault talk by talking about the CFP. I just got excited about the possibility of Joe Brady joining Brent Venables at Oklahoma. I mean, it'll be interesting where he goes, I'll tell you that. It will be college. There's no question about that. But I've got to talk about the CFP. The four teams are set. The committee got it right. The way that Saturday unfolded, there was no way that there'd be any surprises. I mean, was there the possibility of chaos? The answer is yes. But as those games unfolded involving the top four teams, you had a sense that things wouldn't go crazy. In the second half, Alabama thoroughly outplayed Georgia. They were only up by seven at the half. I mean, I don't think anyone was extremely confident in Bama at that point. Yeah, you had to like where they were, but even the biggest Crimson Tide fan couldn't deny that Georgia had a chance to win that game. And again, if Alabama had lost, they're out of the CFP. And a team like Notre Dame gets in. But give Bama credit, they bared down in the second half. Stetson Bennett threw two second-half interceptions. Bryce Young had a really good game. Threw for over 400 yards, had three touchdowns. Jameson Williams was insane. Seven catches for 184 yards and two touchdowns. John Mechie had six catches for 97 yards and a touchdown. Slade Bolden got involved. Five catches for 54 yards. I mean, give Bama credit. They knew the pressure that was on them. And with that pressure comes two possibilities. Either you rise to the occasion or you fold like a cheap suit. Alabama rose to the occasion and earned the number one seed. They deserved to be the one seed. I know some people will say Michigan. If you beat a good Arkansas team, then win an epic Iron Bowl, then beat Georgia in the SEC title game, destroy them in the second half, you deserve to be the one seed. Now, I don't want to take anything away from Michigan, okay? This Michigan team is for real. This is a great Wolverines team. What's been the knock on Michigan since Jim Harbaugh went back? They couldn't win the big game. They just won back-to-back big games. They beat OSU to vault themselves into the CFP picture, then they 
utterly destroy the Hawkeyes, 42-3, an absolute rout. This Michigan team has a chance to win the national title. They are that good. They can beat Georgia. I'm not saying they will. I'm just saying they have that ability. I saw people getting on Kirk Ferentz for not benching Spencer Petras sooner. It wouldn't have mattered. The way the Wolverines were playing, Chuck Long could have been under center for the Hawkeyes. And Michigan still would have won that game. Give Michigan credit. This is a great ground and pound team. It's old school football, but it works. I mean, I'll say this. Alabama-Cincinnati... I'm going to be rooting hard for Cincinnati. But against Bama, I don't see how they win. Sadly, I think it'll just further the arguments of the people who say that group of five schools shouldn't be in the CFP. Michigan-Georgia has a chance to be an epic game. I am going to be locked in to that Orange Bowl. It's on New Year's Eve. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to watch the Orange Bowl. Then put on the Honeymooners. Then watch the ball drop. Then go back to the Honeymooners. And I'm in bed by four. Alright, now I'll give you some MLB Volk talk. No, the lockout isn't over. There's no way that we get that lucky. Instead, I want to talk about the Baseball Hall of Fame having six new inductees. In case you're unfamiliar, the Baseball Hall of Fame did away with the Veterans Committee as we used to know it. They divided it up into four different panels. There's the Early Baseball Committee, the Golden Days Committee, the Modern Baseball Committee, and the Today's Game Committee. Last year, because of the pandemic, these panels didn't meet. It's why there were only two new inductees, Dick Cagle and Al Michaels. I mean, this year there's a chance there's another shutout, but at least we're getting actual players honored as opposed to a sports writer and a broadcaster. It's a lot more impressive if you look back at the years and you see players on there as opposed to just non-players. Now, the early baseball committee inducted two people, people who I've spoken about on this show before, with the help of Stephen Greenes, an excellent interview that I did earlier this year. I highly advise you to check it out. Two Negro Leaguers got in. Buck O'Neill finally got into the Hall of Fame. And Bud Fowler narrowly got in. You need 12 votes to get in. O'Neill got 13. Fowler got 12. I think it's an absolute travesty that Buck O'Neill was posthumously inducted. You have him speaking at the induction ceremony in 2006 where 
you honored a ton of Negro Leaguers. People like Ray Brown, Pete Hill, Biz Mackey, Mule Suttles, etc., etc. All got honored by O'Neill. It is an absolute travesty that he didn't get in in 2006. But he handled the robbery with trademark grace. Very few people would have been as classy as Buck O'Neill was. It's an absolute disgrace that he didn't get in sooner. Bud Fowler is regarded as the first black man to play professional baseball. It is a shame that history has kind of forgotten him. I give Stephen Greenez a ton of credit for bringing him back into the limelight somewhat. I spoke to Stephen last night and I told him that I don't think O'Neill and Fowler get in if not for his book. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a concerted effort now to recognize these forgotten legends. And I think Stephen deserves a lot of credit for that. You know what he said to me? He said that he wants more people in. He's not satisfied with just two. And that's fair. That's absolutely fair. I mean, I don't know how a guy like John Donaldson isn't in. I don't know how a guy like Cannonball Redding isn't in. Steven, if you're listening, I think we'll get more Negro Leaguers in at some point. I don't think this is it. I really don't. But now on to the Golden Days Committee. That committee inducted four people. Gil Hodges, Jim Cott, Minnie Minoso, and Tony Oliva. It's a 16-man committee. You need 12 votes to get in. Dick Allen fell one vote shy of induction. I don't know how you look at Dick Allen and say he's not a Hall of Famer, but you look at Gil Hodges and say he is a Hall of Famer. Gil Hodges should not be in the Hall of Fame. Okay, look, Gil Hodges had a really good career, a career anyone would be proud of. Arguably the best first baseman of his era. Won two World Series at the time of his retirement. He had the most home runs by a righty hitter. Really good fielder. Beloved figure in New York and L.A. Then obviously he goes back to New York. Plays for the Mets for a little bit. Then he goes to the Senators. Becomes manager there. Does nothing. Then he goes to the Mets again as their manager. Wins the 69 World Series. And dies on a golf course in 1972 at the age of 47. Really good player. Okay, no one can tell you that Gil Hodges was not a very good player. But he's not a Hall of Famer. Oh my God, you Mets fans. You want to put everyone affiliated with the 69 Mets in the Hall of Fame? You want to put Jerry Grody in the Hall of Fame? You want to put Ed Cranepool in the Hall of Fame? You want to put Bud Harrelson in the Hall of Fame? How about Cleon Jones? 
Tommy Agee, Ron Swoboda, Don Clendenin, Art Shamsky, Gary Gentry, Tug McGraw, Ron Taylor. Let's put all those guys in the Hall of Fame, right? I mean, come on. Rube Walker, too. Gil Hodges finished his career with under 2,000 hits. Gil Hodges has 370 career home runs. It's not like he was even at the top of the leaderboard at the time of his retirement. Yes, among right-handed hitters he was, but we're going to lower the bar because he was a righty? I mean, nowadays we have how many righties ahead of Hodges? Jeff Kent has seven more home runs than Gil Hodges. We're going to put Jeff Kent in the Hall of Fame because he had 377 home runs? No, Kent is borderline, but he's not a Hall of Famer. Albert Bell has 381. He's not a Hall of Famer. Andres Galarraga has 399 home runs. He's not a Hall of Famer. Let me ask you something. In 55 and 59, his two World Series winning years as a player. I don't care about just winning the pennant. Winning the World Series. Was Gil Hodges ever the best player on any of those teams? 55, he wasn't. Duke Snyder hit over 40 home runs that year. In 59, it gets closer. But I still think you put Snyder ahead of him. I think Wally Moon goes ahead of him. You can make the argument for Don Drysdale. You make the argument for a guy like Charlie Neal. You want to tell me 1969? Look, 69 was a magical season. The Miracle Mets. Okay, Hodges deserves a ton of credit for what he did with that team. But that's the only year of Hodges' managerial career where one of his teams finished with more than 84 wins. He followed up 69 by going 83 and 79 in back-to-back years. Then he died on a golf course. We'll never know what would have happened to the Mets if Hodges didn't kick the bucket. Maybe they win the World Series in 73. Maybe he saves Tom Seaver for Game 7. We'll never know. Also, here's the thing. Do you know how many times Gil Hodges was on a Hall of Fame ballot? 35. There's gotta be a limit. Okay, if it takes you 35 tries to get into the Baseball Hall of Fame, at some point, someone needs to say, maybe this guy shouldn't be in. It defies all logic to me that Gil Hodges is a Hall of Famer. All due respect to you Mets fans... But he's not a Hall of Famer to me. He's just not. Jim Cott is. I'm glad that Jim Cott's in the Hall of Fame. Here's a guy who finished with 283 wins. Here's a guy who was one of the best lefty starters of his era. Was he overshadowed by guys like Bob Gibson and Denny McLean and Tom Seaver and Nolan Ryan, Steve Carlton 
and Phil Necro. Mickey Lolich, too? The answer is yes. But don't let that take anything away from what Cott did. 283 wins. That puts him 31st all time. He's ahead of Hall of Famers like Jim Palmer and Bob Feller and Jack Morris. He actually has more wins than Bob Gibson. He was an excellent fielder. He's one of the best fielding pitchers of all time. That does mean something. I don't think it gets you in by itself, but I think it can push you over the edge. I understand the knock on Cott. Only three All-Star teams. Only three Hall of Fame years. Maybe four if I'm being generous. 62, I wouldn't count as a true Hall of Fame year. But he made the All-Star team that year, so I'll give him a pass. And he was a compiler. He pitched until he was 44. The thing is, though, with the compiler argument, when did you want him to stop? Cott played a big role on the 82 Cardinals, a team that won the World Series. He was the lefty out of that bullpen, him and Dave LaPointe. It's not enough to say he was a compiler. You've got to tell me when he should have stopped playing. If you can still play, keep going. Like, Jamie Moyer's a compiler. Alright, Jamie Moyer really should have stopped after the 09 season. Yes, the Phillies won the pennant that year, but it was clear that he just didn't have it anymore. He had lost his stuff. He hung around for a couple more years. Got to 269 wins. Got to over 2,400 strikeouts. Not a Hall of Famer. He's a compiler. Jim Cott, while he played a long time, I don't think he's a compiler. Also... He's a beloved broadcaster. Did an excellent job covering the Yankees. For my money, Jim Cott's a Hall of Famer. I don't mind him needing to wait, but he is a Hall of Famer. Minnie Minoso is a little interesting. Here's a guy who served as a huge inspiration for... Cubans wanting to make it in the majors. If he can do it, so can you. I mean, he was a classy guy. Really nice guy. Loved the game of baseball. Did a lot for the sport off the field. I can't say anything bad about Minoso as a person. As a player, what I'll say is, he's not a Hall of Famer. Less than 200 home runs, just over 2,100 hits. He was a compiler. He hung around a lot longer than he should have. It artificially inflated his totals. Look, from an off-the-field perspective, I think you put Minnie Minoso... Up there with anyone. From an on-the-field perspective, which is all I care about for the Hall of Fame. I don't care about the character clause. I don't care about anything like that. He's not a Hall of Famer. Good career. Career that anyone would be proud of. Not a Hall of Famer. Tony Oliva is interesting. If you like peak years, you will put Tony Oliva in the Hall of Fame. From 1964 to 1971, this guy was as good as any player in baseball. Made the All-Star team every year. Led the American League in hits five times. 
led the American League in batting average three times, two-time runner-up for AL MVP. Tony Oliva had a peak as good as anyone. The thing is, though, if I'm going to put a player in for peak years, I'm putting in Dick Allen first. There is no planet where Dick Allen, an MVP, someone who by modern metrics, which we love supposedly, deserves to be in the Hall of Fame less than Oliva. Who voted for Tony Oliva and not Dick Allen? What, because Oliva made one more All-Star team? I think the MVP negates that. The three batting titles? Okay, the three batting titles are impressive. No question. Dick Allen has two home run titles. Dick Allen's power more than negates anything Tony Oliva did. I'm not even a big fan of the peak years argument. But an eight-year stretch where Oliva was just as good as anyone in baseball is impressive. And you have a strong argument for putting him in the Hall of Fame. It's not as strong as the argument for Allen. Allen had a better peak. Allen's peak was ten years. It was all in a row. This guy should have gone in when he was alive. What? Because you didn't put in Allen when he was alive? You think he can wait? You want to put Oliva in before he dies? I just don't understand how Tony Oliva gets in before Dick Allen. That's the thing. If I'm going to put someone in for peak years, it needs to be incredibly impressive. And Tony Oliva has an argument... I'm not saying he doesn't. I'll say this. I'd put him in over Hodges. I'd put him in over Minoso. I don't think I'd put him in over Danny Murtaugh. My ballot would have been Dick Allen, Jim Cott, Danny Murtaugh, and probably Tony Oliva. I understand it's probably not the fairest thing in the world to look at Oliva through the lens of Allen, but the argument is the same. It's peak years. You cannot tell me that Dick Allen had a worse peak than Tony Oliva. That's what upsets me. The inconsistency. I'm okay with Tony Oliva getting in. All right, I'll give him my final vote. I have no problem with that. I just don't think he should have gotten in over Dick Allen. I'll close this show out by eulogizing a surefire Hall of Famer. This guy should have gotten in a lot sooner than he did. It's Claude Humphrey who died on Friday at the age of 77. Claude Humphrey is one of the best defensive linemen in NFL history. He's right up there with Bruce Smith. He's right up there with Curly Culp. He's right up there with Michael Strahan. He's right up there with all those guys. From the late 60s to the early 80s, you'd be hard-pressed to find a more dominant defensive player than Humphrey. All due respect to guys like Alan Page and Carl Eller and Jack Lambert and guys like that, The thing is, though, those guys played on some of the greatest defenses of all time. Humphrey didn't. Humphrey was really doing everything by himself. 
People have gone back and have retroactively applied sex to the older players. In his first four years, Humphrey never had less than 10 sacks. From 1970 to 1974, he made the Pro Bowl every year. In 75, he got hurt. He missed the whole season with a knee injury. He was 31 at that point. You'd think a knee injury for a 31-year-old NFL player would be a death sentence, right? No. Humphrey came back in 76 and set a career high in sacks with 14 and a half. The year after that, he made his last Pro Bowl. Now in 78, he got hurt again. He only played in four games. That was the only year where the Falcons made the playoffs with Claude Humphrey on the team. Granted, he didn't play in their two playoff games. They narrowly beat the Eagles 14-13. Then they lost to the Cowboys in the divisional round 27-20. But still... At least the Falcons were in the playoffs. The fact that the Falcons waited until Humphrey's last year with the team to make the playoffs is really sad. I understand that they didn't have a choice. But still, this guy deserved to be in the playoffs more than once with the Falcons. Humphrey finished his career with the Philadelphia Eagles. By far and away, a more successful team. Dick Vermeil was just hitting his stride. It's kind of funny. The Falcons beat the Eagles in the playoffs. Then Humphrey joins the Eagles. And he had a great season. He started every game. He had 11 sacks. The Eagles beat the Bears in the wild card round, 27-17, but they lost to the Buccaneers, 24-17. The year after that, the Eagles had the best defense in the league in terms of points against per game. Humphrey had 15 and a half sacks, which eclipsed his previous career high that he set in 76. That's despite the fact that he only started one game that year. The Eagles destroyed the Vikings in the divisional round. They ran away with that game late in the NFC title game. They destroyed the Cowboys 20-7. Danny White couldn't do anything in that game. But in Super Bowl 15, the Eagles' defense folded. Jim Plunkett was masterful. He threw three touchdowns. He won Super Bowl MVP. Humphrey got a little heated during that game. He was called for roughing the passer against Plunkett. He picked up Ben Drath's penalty flag and threw it back at him. You really can't do that. The Raiders won Super Bowl 15, 27-10. The year after that, the Eagles again finished with the best defense in the NFL in terms of points against per game. But the New York Giants stormed out to an early 20 to nothing lead. And that was basically all she wrote. The Giants won 27 to 21. It's a shame that Humphrey has been 
forgotten about. If he had played on more successful teams like the 70s Steelers, he wouldn't have needed to wait until 2014 to get into the Hall of Fame. He should have gotten in a lot sooner. Retroactively, he's been credited with 130 career sacks. That places him 24th all-time. Ahead of guys like Dwight Freeney, Robert Mathis, Simeon Rice, Mark Gastineau. Great players. He won Defensive Rookie of the Year in 1968. He's in the Falcons' Ring of Honor. Rightfully so. May he rest in peace. Brooklyn Net Show comes your way tonight. Regular episodes of the Jacob Volk Show come your way every weekday afternoon this week. Next week I'll be in Florida, so no shows. Until next time, I am Jacob Volk saying that Jacob Volk is sad that Bob Dole is dead.